Hi everyone, and welcome to the journey of silicon innovation at AWS. My name is Ron Diamant. I'm part of the Napuna Labs team, which is the silicon team within AWS, and I lead the architecture group of our deep learning accelerators, Inferentia and Trainu. I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk about the custom chips that we're building here at AWS. So far, we've built chips in multiple areas, spanning I.O., data center infrastructure, core compute, and machine learning. With the AWS Nitro system, we've moved functionality away from a traditional hypervisor and into purpose-built chips. This improves I.O. performance, frees up CPU cycles, and raises the security bar of our servers. Then, with Graviton, we've built host CPUs that deliver the best performance for a wide range of cloud workloads, while also reducing cost at the same time. And lastly, Inferentia and Trainium are purpose-built deep learning accelerators that we've built from the ground up to deliver best-in-class performance and price performance for machine learning inference and training workloads. I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn. But first, let's spend a little more time on why we build our own chips at AWS. And the answer is simple. We build our own chips when it leads to direct customer value. By building our own chips, we get to specialize our hardware for our use cases at AWS. I'll show you today how we tailored the Nitro system to the AWS infrastructure to improve both the performance and the security of our servers. We also get better speed of execution. We own the end-to-end -end development process from defining the product to deploying it into the data center, which enables us to bring technology to customers' hands faster. We shrink the time from concept to deployment through software hardware co-design and by leveraging the AWS clouds for faster development, which includes elasticity, where we change our server capacity according to the needs of the project, and also by choosing the most optimized instances for each workload. Building our own chips also allows us to innovate more and thus create more value for our customers. When you have the teams developing the silicon, the server, the software, and the hypervisor all under one roof, you get to innovate and optimize end-to-end -end with the actual customer use cases in mind, rather than optimizing the different components in a silo. And lastly, we design our chips and systems with built-in operational monitoring and self-healing. We continuously track the device health and predict failures ahead of time, and we then take actions to, pre to prevent our customers from hitting these failures. We also bake features into our chips to be able to continuously refresh the firmware that is running on them without disrupting the customer's workload which allows us to fix issues quickly and seamlessly across the fleet. And our engineers love this feature, by the way, because it allows them to see their contributions and how they are helping customers in days or weeks rather than waiting for months. Let's take a minute to look into what a typical server looks like, and we'll compare it to what, we, uh, what we're building at AWS. At the heart of a server is the processor, and that processor typically needs access to I.O., like storage or networking. And in some cases, we also attach a coprocessor to speed up a certain workload, like graphics or machine learning. At AWS, we're innovating across all the devices that you see on the screen. The traditional I.O. cards are replaced with a set of Nitro cards that accelerate networking and storage functions. Aside from the performance benefits, which I'll explain in more depth later today, this also improves security. The Nitro cards enable encryption of data in transit and at rest without any performance penalty. And on top of that, the Nitro security chip, which is a small chip that you see next to the processor, provides with hardware-based root of trust, as well as protection for all critical motherboard resources. For the coprocessors, we have Inferentia and Trainium, which improve the price performance of deep learning workloads by more than 2x compared to off-the-shelf solution. They also reduce the carbon footprint of the large machine learning workloads significantly. And finally, while we've had x86 processors from Intel and AMD for a long time, 
We're also building our own Graviton line of processors, which provide 40% better price performance compared to other processors in ETC2 and on-prem. Let's take a deeper look into each one of these devices, and we'll start with the Nitro system. Nitro is a fundamental rethink of how, we, how virtualization in the cloud should be done. It all started with a simple question. After building EC2 for almost a decade, if we apply all of our learnings, how would we change our server platforms? And the answer to this question ultimately led to the Nitro design. We introduced Nitro back in 2017 with the C5 instance, but we actually started working on it back in 2013 with the C3 instance. That's when we first introduced enhanced networking, which uses PCIe single root IO virtualization to provide high performance networking capabilities without hypervisor involvement. And this resulted in higher IO performance, lower latency, and improved CPU utilization. Since 2017, all EC2 instances that we've launched have been based on the Nitro system, so chances are that you've been using Nitro for quite some time. Here's a view of how a server looked like before the Nitro system. We have the customer instances running on top of the Zen hypervisor. And Zen's great, but it did a lot. It did memory management and CPU scheduling, device simulation, security group enforcement, and quite a few more. It even had a full-blown Linux user space. You could SSH into it. And all these functionalities use resources on the host CPU. So we started offloading these functions into dedicated hardware devices. First, we offloaded the IO functions to a set of Nitro cards. And it's not only one card, by the way. It's a family of cards that are all built around the same Nitro chip. We have cards for VPC networking, for Elastic Block Store, for local instance storage, for Aqua to accelerate analytics, and a few more. Let's take a deeper look into one of these cards, and specifically the Nitro card for VPC networking. This card offloads all VPC data plane network functions from the hypervisor to a dedicated hardware. This includes packet encapsulation and decapsulation, security group enforcement, flow logs, routing decisions, and quite a few more. So all these functions used to run the hypervisor and are now offloaded to a dedicated hardware. This card also enables transparent 256-bit AES encryption of data in transit with no performance overhead. The VPC card presents a network adapter to the host, which we call ENA, Elastic Network Adapter. And one of the cool things about ENA is that it's extendable. We've gone from offering 10 gigabits per second to 25 to 100 gigabit per second, and all of that without changing the ENA driver. So you can run your machine image as is on an instance that has a faster network, and it will just work. And this is pretty unique, actually. Usually to get this kind of a performance delta, you would need to install new drivers. And it's not only that. It's a software-defined network, which means that we can introduce new networking capabilities over time. One example for this is the Elastic Fabric Adapter, which provides with the kernel bypass capability and leverages the SRD protocol that we built in-house in AWS. SRD stands for Scalable Reliable Datagram, and we've built it for scaling HPC and distributed machine learning workloads to thousands of nodes at high performance. These workloads are unique in the sense that they require high network bandwidth, but also low latency and low jitter. And SRD achieves that by dynamically load balancing traffic between multiple available network paths to reduce fabric congestion and avoid hotspots. So here's how a server looks like after we moved all IO, management, and monitoring functions away from the hypervisor and into dedicated hardware. You can see how DOM0, which is the privileged domain in Zen's terminology, is significantly offloaded, and many of its functions are now handled by the Nitro system. But we didn't stop there. Next, we asked ourselves, what can we do to improve the platform security? And that's how the Nitro security chip came to be. 
It's a simple idea. A security chip that sits in front of every bus that can write non-volatile storage and blocks any unauthorized access. But why do we need this? The idea here is that modern servers have multiple microcontrollers that manage different parts of the system. For example, we have one microcontroller that runs software to control how fast to spin the fence in the server. And since every piece of software can have bugs, we need an ability to update that software. But we definitely don't want to allow the guest VMs to update that software. So we simply block all writes from the host CPU to non-volatile storage, and we only allow the Nitro controller to deploy such software updates. In addition to that, we also cryptographically check the content of the non-volatile storage on every boot to make sure it's not modified or compromised in any way. It's a clean and simple solution that allows us to achieve hardware-based root of trust and guarantee that nothing that our users do on the host machine will permanently change the system state. So in this step, we also moved security functions from the host to the Nitro system, achieving hardware-based root of trust and protecting critical motherboard resources from the host machine and from the user code running on it. Now, after off offloading IO and security functions to dedicated hardware, we were able to go back and look at what the hypervisor actually needed to be. This led us to a lightweight hypervisor with all the previous functions that we discussed removed. This lightweight design significantly reduces the threat surface and enables performance that is indistinguishable from bare metal. So here's how a server looks like with the full Nitro system. IO and security functions are all offloaded to dedicated hardware. DOM0 is completely removed and the Zen hypervisor is replaced with a lightweight Nitro hypervisor. So just to recap, we started with a server that looks like this, and with the Nitro system, here's how it changed. All I.O. functions are offloaded to Nitro, DOM0 is removed, and the Zen hypervisor is replaced with a lightweight Nitro hypervisor. Let's see how this improves performance. In this graph, I'm going to show the system's response time, meaning how long does it take the system to respond to a certain event. And that event could be a received network packet, an expired timer, or anything else, really. The x-axis is the response time, and the y-axis is the probability to measure such a response time, because every system has some variability. Let's start with the C4 instance, which was our last instance before the Nitro system. As you can see, the bulk of responses are between 70 and 170 microseconds, and there's actually a tail latency that goes all the way to 1,000 microseconds. Now let's add C5 with the Nitro system. You can see that two things happened. The distribution tightened a lot, and also it moved far to the left. This is enabled by the Nitro Lightweight Hypervisor, which reduces the wake-up delay and jitter in our systems. And if I add the Graviton-based C6G instance, the distribution tightens even further, and it's moved even further to the left. And you'll see why when we talk about Graviton. Okay, so we talked about performance and we talked about security, but there's one more aspect of the Nitro system that I wanted to share with you. It's a modular design, almost like a Lego of components, and with the Nitro system as the common component across all servers in AWS. And this ended up significantly accelerating our engineering pace. Before Nitro, it took us 11 years to grow from one instance type to 70. And with Nitro, we grew from 70 to over 500 instance types in just four years. And these 500 instance types mean that our customers can choose the most optimized instance types for their workloads. All right, let's change gears and talk about host compute. Graviton is a line of ARM-based server processors that are available exclusively at AWS and provide the best performance and price performance in their instance families. ARM processors are used everywhere. They power the phones and tablets that we use every day. They are starting to show up in laptops, 
And recently with Graviton, they're available, they're available in servers as well. We're on our second generation of the Graviton processor. We announced the first one at reInvent 2018, and a year later, the second generation. Graviton 2 increased the core count by 4x compared to the first generation, the performance by 7x, and the performance per core by almost 2x. In a single generation, these are massive numbers. And Graviton 2 also has dedicated optimizations for server workloads, which significantly reduce system call latency and context switch times. Graviton 2 is powered by the ARM Neoverse N1 core, and we work closely with ARM on the development of that core. It's a large chip with around 30 billion transistors at, around, at a 7 nanometer process node. Compared to its equivalent servers, Graviton 2 is about 2.5x more power efficient and 40% more performant. And since we always work to pass cost savings to our customers, it's also 20% less expensive. Our end-to-end R&D ownership of Gravi Graviton 2, along with the ability to share building blocks from Nitro, allowed us to deliver this functionality to market in a fraction of the time compared to typical projects of that scale and get it to customers' hands faster. Let's talk about what makes Graviton 2 perform. Every modern processor has cores, and these cores fetch, decode, and execute instructions. And to reduce the overheads of memory accesses, we use caches that hold copies of the data next to the processor. Processors have evolved over the years to have a tiered memory system. We can typically access the level 1 cache in about a nanosecond and the level two cache in roughly five nanoseconds, L3 in tens of nanoseconds, and the external memory, or DRAM, in about 100 nanoseconds. This is why caches are so important. They significantly reduce the overheads of accessing memory. Let's start with describing x86 cores. Over time, these cores have gotten pretty big, and to improve their efficiency, multiple threads have been added. And by threads here, I don't mean operating system threads. I mean simultaneous multi-threading, or sometimes called hyper-threading. That's where each thread looks like a CPU to the operating system, but these threads share the underlying hardware resources, like ALUs and caches. The upside of these threads is that they typically improve hardware utilization, but the down downside is that they contend for resources. So for example, if a core only has one divider, and both threads want to divide, one of them will have to wait. With Graviton, there's no need for multi-threading. This is enabled by each core being smaller and more efficient, so we can pack, pack two times the number of cores into a chip. And this provides better scalability, as the core, the L1, and the L2 aren't shared. This also improves security, by the way. There is a whole class of security issues that are related to multi-threaded execution that doesn't apply to Graviton simply because Graviton doesn't have multiple threads. Graviton also have, has significantly larger L1 and L2 caches compared to other available servers in EC2 and on-prem. While the absolute numbers that you see on the screen are somewhat similar, in Graviton, the L1 and L2 caches aren't shared. They're dedicated per vCPU. And this means that we effectively have 2x the L2 cache per CPU, per vCPU, and 4x the L1 cache per vCPU. So we've got these efficient cores. They have dedicated optimizations for server workloads. They have no threads, big caches. Now we need to integrate them together. If I would lift the lid off from the chip I showed you a few slides ago, you would see this. The black square in the middle, that's the silicon with 30 billion transistors. And in there, we have 64 cores connected via a two terabytes per second mesh interconnect. Embedded in that mesh is a 32 megabyte less level cache. And between that cache and the caches in the cores, there's over 100 megabytes of user accessible cache on the processor. We've got a lot of flexibility for different instance types with 64 lanes of PCIe Gen 4 and 200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth from eight DDR4 3200 channels. And the cool thing here is that it's easily extractable memory bandwidth. 
we can extract 83% of the theoretical max with simple loops. And that's compared to other systems that are typically in their 60s or even lower. So how does Graviton perform? I have several benchmarks here comparing Graviton 2 based M6G, M6G instances to the x86 based M5 instances. First, I'm showing SpecInt 2017. SpecInt is a collection of CPU intensive workloads that do things like compiling code, route planning, Sudoku solvers, and quite a few others. Here we're showing 44% higher performance per vCPU on an, M6, on an M6G instance compared to an M5. Next, we have Nginx, which is a popular web server and load balancer. We configured it as a load balancer with 500 HTTPS clients load balancing across four backend servers. And here, M6G is able to push 24% more requests per second compared to M5. And lastly, I have Mem Memcached, which is a popular key value store that is typically used in order to improve the application's responsiveness compared to using a more traditional database. And here we see that M6G can service 43% more requests per second relative to M5, and it achieves that at a lower latency, which is exactly what you would want from a key value store. As of today, we have nine instance types that are powered by Graviton2, including a general purpose instance, a burstable instance, and a set of compute optimized and memory optimized instances. And they're available in sizes that range between one and 64 vCPUs. And this week, we'll be announcing a few more Graviton2 based instances, so stay tuned. As we all know, we shouldn't solely rely on benchmarks we need to see performance on real-life workloads. So let's see what our customers are reporting. Lyft is running a compute-intensive Python and Go-based service. They benchmark moving from a C5 instance to a C6G instance and found 30% better price performance. They also commented that moving to Graviton was straightforward and they're looking forward to moving the majority of their fleet to C6G. Next role has Erlang, Go, and Java workloads, and they've realized 50% cost savings by migrating to Graviton2, and they plan to switch everything that they can in the near future. Snap uses Amazon's Elastic Kubernetes ser service to run their messaging core service. And with Graviton2, they were able to reduce the size of their fleet and significantly lower their costs. And lastly, SmugMug, which is one of my favorite stories, saw a 40% improvement in price performance by just recompiling their code to Graviton. And we have more stories like that on our website. The link is on the screen. All right, so we covered data center infrastructure with Nitro, and we covered host compute with Graviton. Now let's focus on machine learning with Inferentia and Trainum. Machine learning is a very exciting workload that is growing at a very fast pace. It is built out of two main phases, training and inference. You can think of a machine learning model as a highly param parameterized function, and in the training phase, we feed that function with a set of examples and tune the parameters to learn a certain task. And then in the inference phase, we deploy the trained model typically at scale, and we don't change the parameters anymore. Inference and training have different needs in terms of memory bandwidth, power consumption, and scale-out characteristics. Talking to our customers, we identified the need to build an inference-optimized instance that is fast, easy to use, and cost-effective. And to achieve that, we built the Inferentia chip and the Inf1 server. It's our most inference-optimized instance at AWS, providing the best price performance for machine learning inference workloads. The Inf1 instance is powered by 16 inferential devices, and each inferential device has four neuron cores and a two-stage memory hierarchy. It has a large on-chip cache local to each one of the neuron cores, and a commodity DRAM that is shared across the cores. We also implemented a fast interconnect that allows us to combine the neuron cores together into a larger virtual device 
which enables us to co-optimize latency and throughput, and more on that later. We support all popular machine learning frameworks and data types to make deploying a model on Inferentia as simple as possible. No need for model tweaking or data type conversion or quantization. Just bring the model as is and run it. By specializing Inferentia to inference workloads, we were able to cut costs and improve power efficiency. Here, for example, we benchmarked Tiolo v4 on INF1 and G4DN instances and measured performance per watt. So the higher, the better. Yellow v4 is an object detection neural network that identifies objects within an image. You can see an example on the right. And G4DN is a GPU-based inference-optimized instance powered by NVIDIA's Turing T4 GPU. As you can see, INF1 achieves between 1.5x and 3x better power efficiency compared to G4DN, with a median power efficiency improvement of around 2x. This means that INF1 instances are greener and cheaper to operate, and as always, we use that to pass along the cost savings back to our customers, which means that you'll get better cost per inference. So let's take a look at the cost savings that we get with INF1. This graph shows cost per inference, so this time lower is better. And I also included the recently launched G5 instance based on the NVIDIA A10G GPU. We benchmarked three popular neural networks targeting different applications. Yellow V4 on the left is the object detection network that we saw in the previous slide. And BERT in the middle is a popular language model that is used in a variety of natural language processing tasks, including question answering and text summarization. And ResNet50 on the right is a popular image recognition model that is quite often used for benchmarking. As you can see, Infon provides significant cost savings per inference across the different workloads that we benchmark here with 2x cost reduction for the vision models and 4x cost reductions for the language models. One interesting request that we heard from customers is to help them co-optimize latency and throughput. They told us that they currently need to trade off between the two. If they use a small batch size, then they get good latency, but throughput degrades and thus cost per inference is increased. And that's because the hardware gets less utilized for a small batch size. And then if they use a larger batch size, the hardware gets better utilized, which drives the cost down, but naturally latency increases. This graph shows exactly that. On the x-axis, we have the cost per inference, and on the y-axis, we have latency. And you can clearly see that customers need to, uh, need to trade off between them when running on a G4DM. If we add the target latency line to this figure, the problem becomes even more apparent. We're basically forced to operate the, the hardware below its maximum utilization point in order to meet the latency target. So we built INF1 to be capable of co-optimizing latency and throughput via a technique that we call neuron core pipeline. Remember the fast inter interconnect that I mentioned before? This is where it gets used. We basically partition a machine learning model into small chunks that can be partially or fully cached in each one of the neural cores, and we form a pipeline between the cores to execute the model. By caching the model parameters on the neural cores, we get to load them from a very fast on-chip memory that can sustain tens of terabytes per second of memory bandwidth, and thus we can achieve maximum hardware utilization even with a small batch size. And as you can see on the graph, with INF1, we can achieve low latency inference together with high throughput and thus low cost per inference. And by the way, this is super easy to use. Just one argument to the, for the neural compiler to determine the depth of the neural core pipeline, and that's it. The compiler takes care of the rest. One of the first users of the neural core pipeline technology was no other than Alexa. As I'm sure you're aware, this is an Alexa device. And when you ask Alexa a question, a textual response is generated, which is then fed into a text-to-speech neural network to synthesize the response back to you. Text-to-speech is a computationally demanding service. 
and it has a strict latency guarantee so that the customer experience is natural and smooth. We don't want a long pause after asking Alexa a question. And as we saw in the previous slide, Inferentia is a great fit for such requirements because it can co-optimize latency and throughput. As a result, the Alexa team managed to cut down their costs by 30% compared to running on GPU instances, while at the same time reducing latency by 25%. And this is critical because it allows the team to experiment with more computationally demanding the models under the same latency guarantee to continue to improve the Alexa voice further. Today, Alexa supports over 100 million devices globally and has already migrated the majority of their voice traffic to Infoen. So if you ask Alexa a question in English or British English or German or Japanese, Alexa will be speaking to you from an Infoen instance. All right, so we have a great coprocessor, but how do we actually use it? I mentioned before that we always build silicon and software together, and so was the case for Inferentia. Our customers build their models using machine learning frameworks, such as PyTorch or, or TensorFlow or MXNet. And we built an SDK that we call Neuron, which connect these machine learning frameworks to the Inferentia devices via a compiler and a runtime. The compiler takes a machine learning model implemented in one of these frameworks and compiles it into machine executable code, which Inferentia can run. And the runtime manages the Inferentia devices, including initialization, deployment of executable code, and handling of IOs. And we also have a set of profilers and developer tools that can be used to debug and optimize performance. Neuron makes it super easy to use Inferentia. Here, for example, we downloaded an open source hugging face implementation of BERT and just added one line of code to compile and run it on Inferentia at high performance. Again, no need for model changes, operator tweaking or quantization, one line of code and the neural SDK takes care of the rest. We have quite a few customers that are realizing the benefits of Info. Airbnb, for example, saw an out-of-the-box 2x performance improvement in their chatbot engine when migrating from GPU instances to Info. And others like Snap, Autodesk, and Sprinkler are using Info in a variety of machine learning workloads, including natural language processing, computer vision, and recommender engines. They all report significant performance improvements and cost reductions. And of course, we're thrilled that customers within the Amazon family have adopted Infoan across many teams, including Amazon Advertising, Robotics, Search, Alexa, and a few more. Okay, so we covered inference, now let's talk training. As you heard in the keynotes this week, AWS Trainium is our new machine learning training coprocessor. Trainium enables high performance and the most cost-effective machine learning uh, training in the cloud. It is built for scale-out with a fast interconnect and parallel engines that can overlap the computation and communication phases. Trainium uses the same neuron SDK as Inferentia, making it simple for developers to start experimenting with it right away. And like Inferentia, Trainium supports all major frameworks and data types allowing for easy migration, migration between different platforms. We'll be sharing more information on Trainium in other reInvent sessions. All right, let's wrap up. First, thanks for spending the time with me today to discuss the custom chips that we're building at AWS. This was a brief overview, and we're still very early in this journey, with more to come in the next few years. We build chips to provide measurable value for our customers, and we work diligently to improve the performance, cost structure, and security of our services at AWS. I look forward to meeting you again in the future and talk about our continued progress with the ultimate goal to allow you to spend more of your time innovating for your customers. Thank you very much. <laughs>